Hi everyone, my name is Yannis Fakinyansha and I'm happy to welcome you to another event organized and produced by Axioma Institute for Contemporary Art Ljubljana. Besides exhibitions and conferences, Axioma has also been doing publishing for a while. Today's talk introduces the 37th issue of the Postscriptum series, which, in addition to the usual print-on-demand format and the e-brochure, is also released in a special edition, traditional print in a paperback format. We are talking about an essay by Barcelona-based curator, researcher and educator Bani Brusadin, titled The Fog of Systems. Art as Reorientation and Resistance in the Planetary Scale System Disposed Towards Invisibility. In the text, Bruce Dean illustrates how something increasingly valuable is happening in, in between and beyond infrastructures as humans design and inhabit them in ever more convoluted ways, emoting, measuring, automating, building worlds and futures. He does so by walking us through artistic methodologies that map, tour, stage, dissect, tell, visualize, or embody the composite network structure we sometimes call our society, sometimes the internet, and sometimes planet Earth. A note to our viewers, during the talk we'll be flashing a promotion code that will give you a discount when ordering the book on Axioma's website. So keep an eye on your screen for that, and here we go. I leave you with Bani Brusadin. Hello everybody, and um, Thanks, Axioma, for uh, this, this chance to uh, actually uh, give an introduction to this publication that uh, you already know, The Fog of Systems, um, which is like a short, a brief essay about a bunch of things related to some kind of uh, artist experimentation uh, related to something that we'll come to call this mega structure or mega machine that goes beyond what we usually consider as simply the network. It's rather like a, some sort of a network planet. Why uh, the fog of systems? Actually, I started with, with a quote um, by the former Secretary of Defense of the US government under Kennedy, uh, Robert McNamara. A few decades after the end of the Vietnam War, um, he said, what the fog of war means is uh, war is so complex that it's beyond the ability of the human mind to comprehend all the variables. Our judgment, our understanding are not adequate and we kill people unnecessarily. So McNamara was talking about the Vietnam War, the big mess, and uh, but the interesting thing to me and this thought is that the, the fog of war was not just literal, it was a metaphor. And we usually should pay attention to metaphors. Think, for instance, of the cloud. It's a very powerful metaphor. The cloud, you know, softly, fluffy, light, it moves very elegantly. And um, the cloud is actually looming over our cities with the, the idea of fog is like the cloud is gaining weight and is going down is lowering down literally looming over our cities our seas our highways our wild places or the wild places that are not ours and actually our planet in general so what's the fog of systems well, the fog of systems is something that you can see in this image. It's not really a fog. Actually, there's no fog in this image. As you can see, everything is in plain sight. It's not a literal fog. It's some sort of obfuscation, some sort of uh, layers on top of each other. And that's precisely what I was interested in like the fog of very complicated and intricate systems that are systems in themselves, so systems of systems. 
For a long time, I've been interested in, in uh, exploring and actually fostering, fueling, helping the idea of uh, communication guerrilla, some kind of um, weird experiments with uh, grassroots communication as some sort of resistance. But what does resistance look like in a, in a context like, like this, where you don't see where the actual frictions are, where you don't understand what's your position in this system of systems, in this mega structure that actually uh, uh, becomes uh, a planet or several planets. So that was my first question when I started to think about these things years ago, how this idea of resistance changes in this context and uh, how does resistance uh, need some kind of orientation in this to know where the real friction is, where power is and what kind of shapes may power, might power take. This is not entirely new. Uh, actually, uh, the good old Karl Marx in the capital used to say that the capital itself will not be found in the factory in itself. It's, it's some, somewhere else. So it's, this is not entirely new, not at all. But for sure, we may say that something change is changing and is going faster, is accelerating in a way. So basically, mm, this uh, little essay revolves around a rather simple observation. Uh, and basically that a new generation of artists, um, most of whom were raised between the end of the, the era of the analog media and the beginning of the age of ubiquitous digital quantification, have begun to explore this vast network of infrastructures that wire, in a way, the planet that we uh, inhabit. We and many other uh, entities, as we know. So I'm, I'm talking about infrastructures here. I'm not talking uh, just about communication networks. Uh, I'm rather interested in seeing all these networks as networks that deal with the management, not just the communication. Networks uh, uh, at this moment in time uh, have this double side. Uh, on the one side, there are networks of human expression and many, many interesting things happen at that, on that stage. But the, say, the very same networks, the very same infrastructures, the very same protocols, the very same decisions that make these infrastructure, infrastructures possible are also tools to manage the material existence of many life forms, of many planetary resources at a huge scale. So this is like an intricate mesh of systems that are increasingly responsible for uncountable aspects of uh, our lives. And we'll get to see that not just our human lives, but the, life, the lives of animals, the life of plants, the life of rocks, the life of other agents, even uh, minuscule uh, agents. So, Basically, my uh, argument here is in this uh, brief essay is, is twofold. Uh, on one side, new concepts and new, new um, accounts of what's going on seem to be necessary. If we wish to focus on this new construction made of material resources, human-made infrastructures, people's habits, even people's hopes and dreams, but also made of non-human intentionalities. And when I say intentionalities, I mean uh, natural intentionalities. So the will of uh, other animal species, for instance, but also artificial intentionalities, such as the intentionality, if we may use this term, probably it's not the right one, the intentionality, uh, quote unquote, of these uh, gigantic data-based systems. So what I'm, 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 I hold is that we may need new tentative concepts to visualize uh, the ongoing changes uh, and also, and most importantly, the latent 
or less visible conflicts within them. And uh, these categories, of course, will naturally tend to prey upon and, and twist, actually, the usual boundaries between disciplines and, uh, and also some very deep-rooted concepts like nature, uh, the, the, the autonomy of something that we may call nature, probably it's not the right term anymore, because the planet is, is becoming something else. It's becoming like a hybrid sensing uh, entity. And we may need also to twist a little bit other concepts like space, like public sphere or jurisdictions, for instance. So this is one part of the argument. And uh, we may need some new terms, new concepts uh, in, the, in this essay. I um, actually uh, mention a few concepts like the mega machine, like uh, Lewis Mumford's mega machine, uh, which is an interesting concept because it includes not just the material infrastructures, but also the bureaucracies, the flows, the protocols around them. Another interesting concept is Matthew uh, Fowler's and the um, concept of gray media, some kind of connectors that make infrastructures possible. And these connectors are, are gray, meaning that they are oftentimes uh, hidden in plain sight both as material objects and as standards for uh, communication logistics. Another very interesting concept uh, or set of concepts is the idea of um, uh, like uh, disobedient objects or, or maintenance. Um, Shannon Mattern is, uh, has a very interesting ideas about uh, repair and how systems are structurally broken. Uh, they shouldn't be fixed. They always need repair and maintenance because they are never totally fixed. And this idea that systems are never a monolith, uh, a, a, something uh, uh, perfect, uh, is an interesting idea. It's rather suggesting and revealing the fact that in this big uh, system of systems is made of patches, is made of different uh, pieces. They are soldered together, they're stitched together. And things are made in this way in some also accidental fashion. Uh, these systems are the result of, uh, you know, the, a, a, a battle for power, a battle for control, the conflicting interests, different incompatible protocols. So it's not a monolith. It may look like one, but when you get closer, you see all these irregularities. And this is also interesting because this is the structural way we should understand this system of systems. Um, different concepts that I mentioned in the book, uh, uh, including haunted machines, the idea that there are specters, uh, not just ghosts, but like some spectral entity within these systems, not just because technology nowadays is so complex that performs some kind of magic. Uh, that's just the, the end result. But, uh, thinking of the machines as uh, haunted is revealing, and this is a very interesting concept brought about by uh, design theorists, uh, Natalie Kane and Tobias Juvel. Uh, haunted machines are actually, all the machines that we are dealing with nowadays, they are really, indeed, they're haunted because their uh, they're decision there, their people there, their uh, forks, some systems work in this way, but may have worked in a different way, just because at some point some de decision was made and uh, uh, so that machines, the design went into one direction instead of the other. These are the specters that haunt the machines. And these are, are actually specters of possible futures, of discarded futures, of futures that are not yet here. There's a final concept that is actually uh, encompassing all the, the previous ones in, from my own point of view, which is uh, Benjamin Bratton's uh, idea of stack. And the stack is actually a very powerful model to understand this complexity. As a model uh, is not uh, something that should be understood as uh, something fixed and something stable. It's rather a map. And the map is actually just a way of approaching the complexity. 
So the stack, this idea of different layers and different interactions, and this interaction that may be conflictual and may bring frictions as well as new power structures is a very powerful model. And I, I actually use it extensively in this little essay to understand uh, the, to, to provide some kind of a, a description of the situation that we are in. And uh, as any description, as any model, even the stack is a useful model to break the existing, the existing uh, structures. Uh, it gives, you know, uh, hot spots, entry points uh, to understand what could be and will be designed differently. So this is the first part of, of my argument. So setting up some sort of stage to understand what's going on. The second part of my, of my argument, which is the one that actually um, I find even more engaging because I'm not a philosopher. Uh, I engage in theory because uh, it uh, uh, provides very useful frameworks and it helps you uh, look closely and more sharply to things. But then what I'm also interested in is artist practice, because in some way, artistic practice, practices uh, are some sort of research. And this research is about infrastructures and also about freedom uh, uh, within these uh, systems of systems. That's why the second part of my argument is about artistic practices. And uh, I will, in the essay, I propose uh, four main like uh, fields or strategies or rather tactics uh, about uh, artistic practices dealing with this complexity. Uh, one is related to vision, uh, meaning the need, the practical need to uh, unlearn, to see like humans. Another one is a set of approaches that we may call the counter forensic approaches. Another one is uh, exploring these new geographies, geographies that are not necessarily the horizontal geography that we knew, that we learned to appreciate through the rationalist uh, Renaissance based perspective. There are different ge geographies, geographies that actually overlap one over the other, flip flop over the other, Geographies that are inconsistent, geographies that are punctured in different ways. And finally, uh, the final category is performing the mega machine, performing the stack. These four tactics are artist tactics that I find interesting because they somehow find shortcuts to very complex decisions. And um, Artistic research is an interesting term in a way, because of course, uh, artists do research. Uh, that's obvious. Uh, any artist, any creator in a way uh, uh, is doing research. There's nothing new uh, here. And also artistic research is a kind of a controversial term because it seems like that uh, some artists do research because they want to you know, appear legitimate because they do something, they do something like uh, the scientists. You know, the real research is the scientist, the, the science research, and, uh, and then uh, some artists are trying to catch up with that. No, no, this is a different kind of research. Artistic research is also a complicated and a controversial term because it's been used uh, very often by academia uh, in order to, you know, uh, structure artist experience and to churn and process it within the, uh, the mechanism and the bureaucracies of the academia. Um, I understand that I'm not especially fond of the kind of use of the term artistic research. I understand artistic research as some sort of, you know, label that we may use or may not use uh, just to understand the ways, uh, the very uh, diverse and irregular ways that artists are trying to explore to get somewhere. They are irregular, they are not precise sometimes, they may be ephemeral, they may uh, not always easy to uh, reproduce or replicate, uh, but it doesn't really matter, as we will see. So, 
the main point here, and as you can see in the images, uh, we can actually appreciate this, that this infrastructure world um, has reached us faster than basically our comprehension, the, our capacity to understand what these infrastructures really mean. Take, for, for instance, these um, Amazon fulfillment centers, these storage areas that, as we know now, are basically uh, algorithmic architectures. They are not designed for human skills. They may use humans, but they use them as terminals. There's a different kind of intelligence there. There's a different kind of design of the space and the relationships between within these spaces. But also the other image, this uh, strange Pentagon, uh, probably you will think that this Pentagon is the Pentagon um, in Virginia, uh, the headquarters of the US defense, uh, but it's not. Uh, funny enough, this Pentagon is the Burning Man uh, site. But this is just like a, like a joke. Um, basically, this image, this strange image with a black background that you can see here, is um, a database image. Basically, these are all the movements of people uh, using this fitness, fitness app called uh, Strava and uh, sending their uh, geo-localized uh, data over to the main servers. The, 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 the app Strava uh, calls this uh, a heat map, a map of human uh, heat in a way. And the interesting thing is that they actually share a lot of uh, data information to, uh, to the people. And you can actually find where people using this fitness app have been running, have been doing their exercise. And you can see that they are designing or they are uh, highlighting a special geography in different parts of the world. Uh, there was uh, some kind of, you know, a problem at this point because uh, some of these users were people in the army, in the military, and they were sharing data about the place where they were. And they were not supposed to tell anyone where they were because maybe they were working in some kind of remote location in some, some secret military base in the desert of Australia, Australia. And they were revealing the geography of this place. They, they were revealing metadata about them. So uh, what I'm interested in here, in, in here is not a security problem. It may be an issue for someone. The interesting thing here, as well in, in the Amazon uh, storage uh, facility, is that these kind of geographies are made of different layers. And these layers are not just geographical in the usual sense. They actually collapse different layers on top of the other through different kinds of visualizations to different kinds of spaces. This situation is a challenge for our senses and it requires quick reflexes to uh, artists as well as or activists or journalists or other researchers. What I mean is that the scale, the materiality and the technical complexity of this accidental network megastructure uh, poses to, to human orientation is something that questions the very possibly, possibility of sensing as well as imagining, mapping, expressing feelings or even doing things together in this new kind of orientation, multi-layered orientation. We find here in a very strange and paradoxical situation, in my opinion, because we have built a very powerful lenses through which or with which uh, we can observe the world uh, or see data from strangers. We have technologies that capture the invisible technologies that capture the incredibly complex. We have uh, worldwide popular media as some sort of real-time expression of human condition. And yet, when everything is potentially observable, uh, then uh, uh, 
where to look, uh, what these lenses could be used for, and how the imbalance of power is embedded in them, then that becomes a political and cultural matter. We're dealing with a totality with no horizon, no horizontal horizon, spaces with different uh, orientation uh, spaces within them. We're talking about something abstract, very abstract, and, uh, and this is also paradoxical because in this age uh, full of details, full of notifications for uh, instant uh, rewards, uh, uh, economies of attention, uh, infinite scrolls, short time attention spans, talking about the abstraction is really hard. And then again, what is this totality of the megastructure of the stack of this accidental mega machine made, made of? I mean, we need to account for material infrastructures, but also for other uh, forms of life, probably not just human as well. And what are the coordinates of this space? You know, we need a, some sort of a multi-dimensional perspective to understand how data are building uh, uh, some of these layers, how uh, protocols, decision, are building interaction between these layers, how, uh, how our uh, own gestures or uh, the tools we use or even our body becomes countable and computable and uh, uh, how the relationship between all these different layers are sometimes designed to be invisible and sometimes they may be visible but are not uh, conceivable by the human mind. Artists uh, uh, have been uh, started to, to tap into, into these new invisible layers of these hybrid constructions. They realize that we have uh, built this kind of uh, infrastructure and then we can understand them in some way. But um, these lenses that we have, uh, uh, that we have built uh, cannot be left in the hands of in the hands of large global corporations, not even in the hands of the of state bureaucracies or the military. So the art, some kind of artists, as well as experimental designers, as well as some kind of um, uh, irregular, un unconventional researchers, have been trying to deal about with this, to deal with the complexity of all this, and they have tried to build alternative narratives and alternative, alternative ways of uh, getting into this. Because they say, we need to describe this, we need, we need to make it visible, and we need to inhabit in a different way these strange geographies in order to question them, in order to redesign them, in order to open them, etc. Basically, the work of artists, technologists, and designers, as well as uh, activists and journalists, have made parts of this global machinery legible and especially vivid. Sometimes they made it awkward, disturbing, or just worth exploring. Here in uh, the image, you can see uh, Vlad and Yoller's uh, well, a detail of Vlad and Yoller's extractivist, new extractivism uh, mapping project. And you can see that this is a first attempt to tap into these things. And uh, artistic methodologies such as this one are not exactly scientific methodologies. Uh, this is really interesting because uh, artistic methodologies uh, in a way, uh, have inhabit uh, different uh, gray zones and find different paths toward all this. Um, Matthew Fowler, um, a few years ago, uh, wrote a short essay about artistic methodologies, and that was very interesting um, as an inspiration. What can artists possibly do in such a complex environment? Uh, the notion of artistic methodologies uh, by Matthew Fowler is interesting because, in a way, he was talking about different hybrid practices uh, and operations. The, he used to talk about uh, second-order memetics. He used to talk about the strategy of, or the tactics of the unready. 
the punk and curiously ignorant ability to enter areas in which knowledge was secured, for instance. He was talking about this art of producing times, bending the tempo and the pace of, of the, the, in the, uh, the issue, the investigated matter. And this is really inspiring in a way to approach this uh, new territory. So basically, when I was uh, talking about different uh, artist tactics related to unlearning to see like humans, to counter forensic approaches like the one we are seeing right now on, on screen, Vlad and Yoler's map, exploring new geographies and performing the stuff. We're talking precisely about these uh, tactics, these shortcuts. And then uh, in, in my essay, I try to, I'm, I'm not mapping a territory. I'm just trying to figure out uh, some of the paths. Uh, in this essay, I mentioned a few, uh, a few works and, and projects that I consider very relevant, very like established in a way. I mentioned just a few names and there would be so many more to, uh, that actually go in the same directions and explore different corners of this, of this complex world. Uh, but I just wanted to set a few examples just to give an idea. In fact, this essay is, uh, is not like, uh, uh, like a final theme of these things, but it's just some kind of, of tool to help uh, people to make connections between things that may look different, but that in my opinion actually share some common ground, some thread. So practically speaking, uh, you will see works like uh, Femke Herbert Graben's uh, Sp Sprawling Swamps project, some something related to uh, speculative design, but without the limitations of speculative design. It's very interesting when someone from an artist art approach uh, is delving into speculative design because in some way it uh, allows her, in this case, uh, Hedda Graven, to uh, explore uh, places that do not exist or are becoming, are getting to exist due to the changes in, on, on the surface of the planet and on uh, of the, the underground be, be beneath them or the air on top of them. So uh, Femke had a Graven's um, uh, Sprawling Swamps is an interesting project in that it builds scenarios where all the, these different layers may be connected. Then these spaces can be uh, navigable, can be uh, uh, touched in installations. Uh, the way this thing is, uh, is materialized and formalized is, uh, is kind of second, like the next step. And you may have different materialization, different formulations for all these approaches. And this is also interesting because it, uh, the formats, the shape that these ideas may take can be different and new ones can be found, uh, actually. Um, uh, Geo cinema, and we can see here like um, a still, like a frame from their most recent film, uh, Making of Earths, uh, are trying to somehow rebuild narratives. Once we understand that the usual geography, this complex mega machine, requires a different approach to them, to it a different approach as human beings. And if we reckon that we need to unlearn to see like humans, then what happens? How do we see again? How do we make this accountable and legible and, 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 and relevant again? So the GeoCinema project um, brought about, carried out by uh, Asia Basdirieva and Solvik Sus, uh, suggest that we should try to see, not as human beings, but to see as a planet. And that's an, inter an interesting uh, suggestion in a way. It's not the only one. I'm not, I'm not saying this is the only approach, not at all, but it, it's actually interesting to see how we can now see as something different than the human beings. 
uh, if we see as a planet, uh, it doesn't mean that we need basically to embrace this uh, very naive uh, idea of nature. We must defend nature. No, no, we need to see as a planet in that the planet is a hybrid sensing machine. Some of who, some of, uh, of its layers are um, animal, some are mineral, some are social, uh, some may be unknown. The, this way of representing the planet is interesting because we are trying to uh, represent it as something irregular, something that can be actually... So, mapping, uh, exploring these new geographies is another very interesting tactic for artists. Drawing a map, drawing some kind of representation of some kind of territory always implies uh, locating yourself within this territory. And uh, yet, as you look up and, and, and draw new frontiers between what is known and the uncharted, then you're also creating a cartography of future change. Because when you draw a map, you're somehow suggesting possible movements through the map, possible interactions through space, but even through time through other people's lives, and of course, animal, vegetal, mineral geographies. So to a certain extent, the act of mapping implies, the act of exploring geographies, implies the danger and also the enchantment of the still unnamed, of the invisible, the unconnected. And by the way, this might well be the reason why, uh, historically speaking, maps have uh, being made not only by the official cartographers uh, uh, employed in scientific missions or military missions, but also by like independent explorers, by outcasts, by visionaries, uh, historically speaking. So basically, mapping these new territories uh, very quickly mutates in this new scene, kind of scene of artists, uh, mutates into something different that requires uh, novel uh, assemblage of different practices. The mapping, exploring might require reverse engineering, social engineering, in some cases, uh, urban exploration, in some other cases, speculative imagination, always historical research, critical culture, uh, some kind of experimentation with visualization and even sound. So, the uh, of my essay that actually talks about uh, this idea of exploring new geographies um, have a few common threads. I mean, we are talking about different practices, but there's something they have something in common. They constantly zoom in and out. That's very imp important. We are talking about large scale pro problems. That's interesting because uh, we tend to focus on very specific things or seeing the large picture, and we need both. We need to go back and forth. And the second point that these practices, in my opinion, have in common is that they put themselves within the territory. They are not documentary uh, approaches. They are not like looking at this from the outside, like God's view. They are not documentaries. They try to be there, in there, within it. And uh, basically because it's impossible to do otherwise. Um, this is interesting because then they, the artists place themselves in, in a very wide spectrum of time and space scales. Uh, something that the mega machine is made of, something that the mega machine encompasses and actually exploits from the nanoscale of chemical reactions to planetary scale infrastructures from the infinitely short time of algorithmic decisions to the immense length of the geological time. And that's why the last tactic that I'm interested in, in performing the stack, performing the mega machine is relevant. Uh, here we can see like uh, 
an image by uh, artist Mario Santamaria, who once said that uh, my intention, quote, my intention is not to investigate the way data travels. It is to move like it, to incarnate, to embody a process that is algorithmic, to get into my trace body. For his project, Travel to My Website, uh, Mario Santamaria traveled from his home in Barcelona to the server where his personal website was hosted in, in Bergamo, Italy. He followed the exact same route as the data. And uh, instead of going through like uh, flights, travel agencies, etc., he planned the journey uh, using Traceroute, an internet uh, traffic uh, diagnostic tool that records the steps of a single of each and single data packet bouncing from server to server until it reaches its final destination. Uh, with just one difference, where a single packet of information uh, takes uh, 60, 70 milliseconds to travel from, uh, from the start to the destination, well, it took Mario 14 days to complete the trip that led him through Switzerland, then Stockholm, then Milan, then Perugia, Italy, and finally to Bergamo. Uh, later on, he documented that this trip through uh, notes and, and pictures like the one we are seeing now on screen, and he published them on the same website. Um, there's a very fascinating loop of transactions between a human body processing the impossible temporality of a machine and the machine that was actually designed to process human temporality, you know, a website, the, the words, the images the feelings, the expression of a, of a human being. Uh, it's a, it's a, it was an interesting loop, in my opinion. That's interesting because contemporary uh, network architectures desperately try to embody the myth of speed, of uh, smoothness. But then new imagination, new forms of imagination arises, arise when you twist this order of the internet discourse by basically switching the roles between bodies and data, data packets, like uh, Santa Maria did. He also did other things like, for instance, he was um, uh, searching for the pretty rare image of the Google device capturing uh, images within a space, but Google device capturing itself in a mirror uh, while he was capturing 360 uh, degree images of art museums. Uh, Mario Santa Maria made like a, a, a compilation, a collection of these strange um, uh, artificial images. Or uh, another thing that he did to twist, to bend these temporalities is to, to configure, uh, uh, to set up a router uh, to establish um, like rabbit holes in which uh, data packets do not follow the shortest way to the destination, but try and enjoy their time within some specifically uh, uh, set up uh, Tor uh, uh, network. And they stay there as long as possible. They keep within Tor, the Tor network, and they defy you know, the, the uh, efficiency and the tempo of uh, the internet. So performing the stack can be actually performed in many different ways. There are so many different entry points. Here, Aaron Bartle uh, performed uh, like uh, social apps, in this case, uh, these apps to share bikes or, or other vehicles in uh, urban environments. And uh, performing means performing within the infrastructure performing with the infrastructure, performing with data, but data is also objects, they are people, they are habits, they are weird facts, such as people throwing their, their skateboards or their uh, bikes in the canal of Berlin. And so you can perform this thing, this whole thing is infrastructure, not just the technical infrastructure, people on them are in part of the infrastructure. So when Aaron Bartle actually uh, gathers a, different, a lot of bikes in the gallery space, or when he actually picks up uh, uh, rusty 
uh, bikes from Berlin's uh, rivers and canals is actually performing the stack in a very unusual in a very unusual way. And then we can get to very weird experiments like the one we're seeing here, um, Evan Franco Mattes uh, Bef node uh, project where they actually uh, use crowdsourcing platforms to pay unknown workers to perform these absurd, hilarious, weird, and sometimes really awkward acts uh, like this, the one we've seen on screen, and then ask these people to record them on their own devices and finally post them on their own uh, video sharing platforms, which were usually non-US platforms and non-mainstream for us from Europe. And uh, as crowdsourcing works, mostly thanks to the time and bodies of the new global precariat, uh, Beth Node, this project also happens to be a visualization of the asymmetrical nature of contemporary networks. And uh, networks that most of the planet might have access, but uh, whose um, economical, uh, economic and power structures are still heavily, deeply uh, uh, unfair, or in some cases, even colonial directly colonial imperialists but at the same time it's it's fun it's interesting because the 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 performances of these uh, workers the performances carried out by by these uh, participants uh, sometimes unaware participants of this project um, and also the the specific the very peculiar gallery installation of the of the project where images uh, were shown on really impossibly located screens uh, that made this vision complicated. The, both things actually engage the participants in a, in a very funny and, and weird game, some kind of voyeur game. And, and I think that this may even be the, like the, the, probably the whole point of the project in this case, uh, taking the best part of internet subcultures and using them as some sort of connector between people, exposing and, and actually twisting the complex visualiza visualization and exploitation processes that mediate such a connection on crowdsourcing uh, platforms or, or even video uh, and social media platforms. So this would also be performing the stack. Uh, and as you can see, performing maybe something aware, something unaware, something that produces some weird and even awkward effects. So basically performing the stack uh, as a tactic or a set of tactics is something that basically uh, does not uh, invent necessarily new forms of performativity, but mostly amplifies the performativity that can be already found in uh, basically many different layers of our society. Uh, even the basic layer of human expression like fun or love or hate or, or, or labor or leisure time or, or hope or despair. despair. Performing the stack um, actually may imply uh, amplifying something that is basic to human performativity, such as in having fun, feeling love, hate, working, leisure time, hope, despair. Performing the that may imply subtly uh, fictional elements. It may imply to mutate the trivial into something that becomes unrecognizable or vice versa may imply occupying the spaces of the, the infrastructure uh, and twisting the protocols or their pace, their tempos. So it's not just performing like in, in a theater. It's rather the effort to inhabit these global platforms, to bring into the surface like horizonless technological frameworks through bodies to some people's bodies, not necessarily the, the artist's body. 
So um, I'm getting to the end here. Um, these different tactics or field of intervention or approaches actually are revealing different entry points in this very complex uh, landscape. And artists that uh, face uh, such a complex system of systems really need to invoke the unexpected and, and the texture, you know, the textures of these infrastructures in order to find, to seek and find different kinds of orientation. Uh, so the artists that I mentioned in this little, this brief essay uh, as some sort of sample, they, we can say that they act as, as cartographers of these uh, system of systems. They are certainly unruly and, and unconventional cartographers because they try to portray something that really resists to be portrayed. They chase like um, uh, some really material power that lacks like a fixed and humanist perspective to describe it. It's something that we don't grasp in full. In fact, um, I, I guess that there's no, there's no reason to expect anything but from, from the, the work of, of these uh, unconventional artists, experimental designers, or, or uh, independent researchers and technologists, we should not expect anything but like a very partial evidence of this. We should expect fragments of stories. We should uh, expect intuitions. We should expect like recombination of objects. And yet all these artistic methodologies, uh, as uh, Matthew Fuller would put it, uh, I guess that help us to uh, retrieve something really important, something that I may call like the lost excitement and the attention span, something that is getting lost sometimes on the way and something that is important if we want to really pay attention to, to or even laugh at the vast ramifications and even inconsistencies of the accidental uh, mega machine and actually the systemic crisis that it's, it's bringing uh, to us. So uh, thanks for, uh, for listening to this introduction and I hope you will enjoy the fog of systems. Before leaving, I would like to remind you that all issues of the Postscriptum series are freely downloadable as e-brochure and available for print on demand on Axioma's website. If you would like to order a copy of the special edition of issue 37, the paperback of The Fog of System by Bani Brusadindaris, you can do it here. The next appointment will be a live streaming event in the framework of the Festival of Conversations Reprogramming Strategies for Self-Renewal. On Monday, September 20th at 7 p.m. Central European time, the Catalan artist and researcher Joanna Moll and the Spanish tech journalist Marta Perano will talk about the real environmental and social impact of the cloud and the data extraction industry. To stay up to date with our cultural offerings, keep an eye on our website and follow us on social media. That's all for today. Greetings from Ljubljana. Nasvidenia.